Good morning, everybody. It's, it's the stroke of 10 past a few minutes. So we need to get started because we have, again, a very exciting program. So I'll just give you a few minutes or seconds to get settled in. Wonderful. Well, let me start again. So good morning and welcome to you all today to our Noni Jabavo lecture. But before we get into the nitty gritty of details, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Himla Sudial, the Executive Officer for the Academy of Science of South Africa. And indeed, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome our guest speaker, this morning, Professor Abdul Razak Gurna. Lovely to have you here. We've already been treated to an exotic display of poetry and literature and, you know, the way the imagination works. And the one thing I have is a very good imagination and, and that's the reason why I'm also a vegetarian because I see things when people speak. And, uh, and, and, and when, when people have the power with words to take you out of your immediate zone into this exotic journey of descriptiveness, I mean, that is the most uh, amazing, amazing uh, way in which to experience reading or listening. And yesterday, I'm still buzzing from yesterday because we were treated to such an exotic display uh, from John Higgins, uh, Professor Gurnau, and then Betty Govenden. But I'm sure today we're gonna have as exciting an opportunity because today in the room, and I'm sure with, with some of this, the fellows who are not in the room but are joining us virtually, we are celebrating our two phases of the future professorial program. And I am delighted that ASAF, particularly through our president, uh, Jonathan Janssen, who is unfortunately not here today, uh, has led this program with distinction. And in leading this program with distinction, we have the opportunity of engaging with the fellows of your caliber. And the few opportunities I have had of engaging it's been so, so special. Um, you, bring, you bring into the academic world this new energy, this vibrancy, uh, the way in which we want to see the ge next generation of scientists develop, but not just develop, but to come into your own and to take your place, not just in society, but in the academic bandwidth nationally, and to establish your footprint internationally. So today is to celebrate you all and to have you in the presence of our guest and uh, for us to have these sorts of engagements. Um, I must say, <clears throat> when uh, Jonathan Janssen uh, raised the issue with me that for our annual humanities lecture that we should invite Professor Gurnau, I was a little bit anxious because I was like, you know, to invite a Nobel laureate to give our annual lecture. And it was almost immediately Professor Gurnau accepted graciously. And, um, and then through our discussions, we, we brought on board in partnership, well, of course, it was always with Stias, because Edward and Jonathan had a lunch date, and they decided on who our speaker should be as a joint symposium. And then, then I get dealt the card to make it happen. And uh, it could only happen because of the wonderful partnership that we have had with STIAS and with both arms, phase one and phase two of the future professorial programs. So I wish to extend my gratitude to, to Jackie and, and Tanya from the Stellenbosch arm and to Kirti and to Megan from the UJ arm uh, to steer us uh, with, with, uh, with Christoph Pau and, and his colleague, and of course not forgetting my own colleagues at the Academy, Raj Mahabir, whose portfolio this falls under, 
my uh, communications uh, officer, Henriette Wagner, and, and a few others. So, so we are here today because of all this background activity. And um, so while we were having this engagement, uh, the Stellenbosch team asked, would it be possible for us to host something with the fellows? And this is how this day has come to fruition. And we're doing this in, in partnership with the University of Fort Hare, and we will hear more about this in a little while, so I'm not going to steal the thunder of Oliver, who's going to introduce us. But I just want to acknowledge, and I'm sure he's listening on the, the wires, Professor Neil Ruiz, who uh, is at the University of Fort Hare. Neil and I go back a while because he's been an absolute anchor in guiding us through our Humanities uh, Standing Committee at ASAF, but also in our Membership Advisory Committee, having chaired under my watch when I was General Secretary, the Membership uh, Advisory Committee for the Humanities and Social Sciences. And we continued to keep in touch, and, and they had invited me previously to one of the future professional program activities. So I'm very, very excited that today can happen. But not to let our UJ colleagues out of the loop, they also asked to host an activity there. And so they are going to host something on the 9th of November with Professor Gurnau as their guest. And not only that, UJ is going to bestow on Professor Gurnau an honorary doctorate. So we are very, very excited. <laughs> That that, is, that that is also going to happen. So colleagues, what started off as a annual humanities lecture has grown into this beautiful partnership with us having the pleasure of Professor Gurnau, who I must say, unstintingly gave off his time in the period that he is here. And he, he's got lots of friends here. He could, spend, could be spending his time, you know, having a lot of social engagements, but I'm so, so grateful while I have the podium to say how happy I am that you have acceded to all our wishes of participating and adding value to the academic uh, landscape in this country of growing the social sciences and humanities, and in particular sharing with us that beautiful, beautiful visionary explosion of words that you bring through your writings. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my, 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 my pleasure to introduce Professor Oliver Niambi, who is going to be our facilitator to this morning. Professor Niambi is a professor of English literature and a Humboldt scholar at the University of Free State, the Kwakwa campus. And so I hand over to you now, good sir and you can lead us through the rest of the program. Oliver. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Sudhya. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it is uh, indeed a very special occasion uh, where we celebrate um, <coughs> and honor the works of uh, Noni Jabavo. And uh, what a way to do that than having in our midst uh, the esteemed presence of uh, a Nobel laureate, uh, Professor Gunnar. So my task today is very simple. Uh, I will be facilitating this uh, occasion from here. And uh, as Professor Sudio Sud has just said, we have online um, Professor Neil Roos, who is at Ellis in the Eastern Cape. Right, so I will just go through how the events will pan out. Um, so shortly we'll cross over to Professor Neil Roos, who is, as I said, at the investor of the, not Free State, I met the investor of the Free State, <laughs> who is at the University of Fort Hare at the Ellis campus. He will introduce to us the uh, lecture today, uh, the history and the background to the lecture today.
He will also introduce our speaker, our guest speaker, Professor Guna. And then we will have the lecture from Professor Guna. We will follow that up with uh, a few follow-up questions, and then we'll close. Right, I really hope that our technology will be kind to us, so let me test if uh, Professor Neil Roos is available. Good morning. I'd like you all to welcome the split site session of the Noni Jabavu lecture. lecture. Normally hosted by, normally hosted by the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Fort Vale. Today's Noni Jabavu lecture is different. It's hosted by the Future Basis Program and ASAF in collaboration with the University of Fort Hare. And we have an illustrious guest. Uh, Today's lecture is presented by the 2021 Nobel Laureate in Literature, Professor Abdul Razak Gurna. I'm Neil Roos, I'm a Professor of History, and I'm Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Fort Hare. And I will be chairing the session from the University of Fort Hare in Alice. Professor Gurna and others on the panel, on the Professor Oliver Nyambi, Professor Shanad Barnabas, Dr. Uhuru Falafala, Dr. Valerie Farim, in Stellenbosch. Some of the audience are in Stellenbosch and some are in Alice. Some are further afield in places like Mtata. And these arrangements to me seem like a metaphor for the disappears, as well as, as, well as contraction, contractions that characterize that carried epoch and epoch mark post and mark post including history including histories of nation of development of continental of continental diaspora. Today's lecture also four lecture also four kinds of collaboration of collaboration of of connections of, between institution, institutions and individuals across the continent the continent the African dice of course of the most notable, the most notable of these connections is Professor Gurnat with us today. With after me briefly explaining, briefly explaining what Noni Jabavu lecture to do, Professor Gurnat will speak. Thereafter, the panel will pose a number of questions, and there may be time for time to follow up questions. Although Professor Nambo will figure out if there is isn't and I time left over for this. Some background about the University of Fort Hare and the Noni Jabavu lectures. After a difficult period when parts of this historic university were placed under administration, the universities entered what it describes as a decade of renewal. As far as I understand it, the faculty's role in this decade of renewal is to reconsider and refresh and renew the disciplines in the social sciences and humanities. And to this end, me, along with conveners Tando Nomkoya and Valerie Farim, decided to host a quarterly seminar, each with an invited speaker. Two respondents. We have two respondents. And what the prince and about teaching, about teaching, one, one, research. But this format isn't cast in stone. What is germane is that the lecture ought to make us think about teaching and research at a particular time, in a particular geography, in a context shaped by a particular history. And to signal the significance of these seminars and to elevate their profile, we chose to designate them to be a named series. And in this regard, we named them for Nontando Noni Chibavu. And today, we could not hope for a more illustrious and insightful speaker whom we are privileged to co-host with our partners, Professor Gurna. Noni Jabavu lived between 1919 and 2008 
and she was a South African writer and a journalist. Her major works were memoirs, The Okra People in 1962 and Drawn in Color in 1963. And in 1961, she was appointed editor of the New Strand, which was a major British literary ma magazine. Barbu was born in the Eastern Cape to a family of prominent intellectuals. In fact, her father, DDT Jabavu, was a founding member of the academic staff at the University of Fort Hare. And she was educated in England, but made regular trips back to South Africa. And in her work, Drawn in Color, as well as her essays, she returns to the question of what it meant to be an African, yet driven by circumstances to live outside of her country. In many sense, a history which parallels that of Professor Gurner. A few words now about our guest, Professor Abdul Razak Gurner, whose life bears, as I say, some interesting parallels to Noni's. Professor Gurner was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for, I quote, his uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism and the fate of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. Professor Gurner was born in Zanzibar in 1948, and he emigrated to England in 1968 with a view to pursuing a university education. And he was driven to flee Zanzibar, which was part of the newly formed Republic of Tanzania. Civil unrest, with violence against the Arab population, made it a very hospitable place. He was not able to return to Zanzibar until 1984. His fantasy was before his father, shortly before his father passed on. Professor Goethe received his PhD from the University of Dublin, where he would be on to be Professor of just Colonial Literature. He writes about my experience of migrants in Britain, in the experience of individuals living in Zanzibar, and how individuals living in these two places find roots into the subjective subjectivities. Professor Goethe is the author of ten novels and numerous short stories. His first novel, Memory of Departure, published in 1987. It's about a failed uprising. His most recent life in 2020. beginning of the century, beginning of the century, and it tracks protagonists down through generations. Paradise, published in 1994, was shortlisted for both the Booker and the Whitbread Prize. By the Steam in 2001, was longlisted for the Booker and shortlisted for the Los Angeles Times Prize. In all of his work, Professor Stoner strives to avoid nostalgia for a romantically pristine pre colonial Africa. Africa. Indeed, it was on a crown. It was on an Indian Ocean island. It was a highly cosmopolitan place. His writing is from Epitar. It pertains to his relationship with the place he left. So, memory to him. To his and work, work, and one point of view to the points to the vivid complexity of his work, highlighting his dedication to and truth aversion and aversion to simplification. Given the parallels, parallels personal, their personal historical trajectories, given the richness of their prose and the pithiness of their insights, how I wish I could have been with the conversation to a conversation between Noni and Professor Gerda. But I'm sure that, but I'm sure that our conversation today will be equally engaging. Over to you, Professor Gerda. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Well, I must say that's the most unusual introduction I've ever <laughs> experienced, where you're sitting there and it's somebody with a video message uh, welcoming you to step up on the stage. Anyway, it's uh, very good to be here and very good uh, of you all to be here. Uh, I think I've understood the, the, what's the purpose, I suppose, the point of this 
gathering and that so many of you are already or soon to be uh, senior academics in your institutions. Um, <clears throat> although I understand that uh, you are from many different disciplines rather than say from the humanities alone or from literature in particular. My own discipline is that, literature, although I'm now retired, so, but you know, these things still buzz around in your head. So I chose to speak to you about um, the local. It's just put there in the program quite nicely, actually, but uh, I won't go back to that. Because it, it interests me very much, this way of thinking of what, what is the, the point or the importance of uh, what I call local. Now, whether that refers to locality or whether it refers to a sense of um, positioning in the world, you know, the, in other words, you don't have to be um, living in, say, Durban to be writing about Durban or to be thinking or engaging with issues that are to do with Durban. Um, so when I say local, I don't mean that you write about where you are if you happen to be living in Iceland at the time or something like that. I don't mean like that. Um, I'm thinking of it as a kind of antithesis to what is sometimes called globalization, I suppose. Um, although there are other terms that stand for what globalization is used to mean. So I'll just kind of probe a few of these to see if we get closer to the idea of what local is and why it's important. So the discourse of globalization in academic studies is to some extent a way of displacing, whether you think this is good or not, is a way of displacing the deep knowledge, I put that in uh, inverted commas, the deep knowledge which is associated with uh, what used to be called, or is sometimes called, area studies. Uh, <clears throat> so area studies assumes and implies that uh, the people doing this work, researching this, um, have a very sharp focus in terms of what society or what culture they're studying. And quite often this is an inter interdisciplinary enterprise. So it will involve historians, anthropologists, literary scholars, etc. But all focusing on, on one area. So you might have um, you know, South African studies or Caribbean studies or something like that. Uh, the problem, or one of the problems with this approach, is that it creates uh, a kind of feudal uh, appropriation approach, shall we say. Who are you? What authority do you have to speak, as you were, about this area? So in, when I was myself uh, starting out as a graduate student, there was a, uh, quite a lot of argument about who who could speak about African literature, say? Who has the, the right to speak about it? Uh, which was a stupid conversation, because it really became a conversation about the credentials of the critic, rather than about the literature itself. So it can mislead sometimes. It can lead to pointless debates. What does post-colonial mean? What does African literature mean? Those kinds of debates, which to me seem a waste of time because all of these are provisional terms. We use them because they're useful to us for a while. We use them as a way of putting together, say, a curriculum, or we use them as a way of grouping scholars or something like that. If we can find a better word for it, let's find a better word and move on. But the real issue is the substance of what we're discussing rather than what we call it. <clears throat> so, I said, and if you think of uh, globalization as a kind of uh, antithesis in some respects of that area studies approach with this deep knowledge idea, might we also see that the, the post-colonial approach, as we call it, uh, is a form of globalization, a process of constructing a global, I'm putting all these in inverted commas because I'm going to try and pack them a little bit in a moment. Uh, so we might, might we think of the post-colonial uh, as a form of globalization, a process of constructing a global discourse of non-Western writing and the representation of its cultures and societies. 
So by doing this, you kind of evade the issue of authority. Yes, you get away from the idea of who can properly speak about this or about that area. It means that if I'm interested, not, this is hypothetical, right? If I'm interested in Caribbean literature, there's nothing to stop me talking about Caribbean literature, or I can't be challenged by being told, have you ever been to the Caribbean? That sort of thing. As it happens, yes, but you know, I'm just saying, if, if it were, if I were to choose to speak about that and I had the, the uh, patience and scholarship to study properly, and learn the specificities that are necessary to do so, there is no reason why I shouldn't be able to speak about Caribbean or Fijian or whatever it might be. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, globalization actually in its usage means the global expansion of Western interests. That's how we normally use the term globalization. When you say globalization, you imagine people in Indonesia drinking Coca-Cola, that kind of thing. That this is what globalization means, the, the expansion of Western authority, power, economy, and so on. That's how we think of it. So almost immediately, the first colonial is this contestant. So to say that first colonial is some form of globalization is already a, a, a kind of, a, a, there's a built-in contradiction at least in its popular usage, that is the popular usage of globalization, which we imagine to be driven by Western interest. So, I put several difficulties in our way, uh, and so, so then let's return to the point that I said I would begin with, which is the local. So what is the local in this configuration? So I'll try to get to that by understanding what it might mean by yet another term, which has already made its appearance in uh, Professor Luce's introduction, and that is uh, understanding what cosmopolitan means. Well, what does cosmopolitan mean? Well, in, to a certain extent, it depends where, where you're standing when, you're, when you ask this question. A familiar way of answering the question, what is cosmopolitanism, is to see it as describing an openness to, cultur to culturally contesting world views. For example, um, a medieval Muslim traveler in Christian Europe would be a, a cosmopolitan figure in that sense, or vice versa, of course, uh, a Christian traveling in the Muslim world in the medieval period. Unlikely, because these were enemy cultures, and therefore to, to see and to want to participate and to know about a contesting worldview, this is how we familiarly understand cosmopolitan. But in time, and there's something noble in this, of course, if we just see it like that, but in time, uh, the advance of European power and European colonialism changed that and from a position of relative weakness, if you think for about, sorry, the arrival of the Europeans in India, say, that they arrive in a position of relative weakness, which means they have to negotiate, they have to trade, they have to do it, 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 it. But with the advance of uh, the authority and power, uh, there comes into being a different kind of cosmopolitanism, which, which then grows increasingly coercive. And in time, of course, it comes to be the, uh, the voice that has greater authority than the voice of the native speaker himself or herself. It came to mean, because the politicians then came to mean that the European traveler or scholar who took an interest and studied non-European cultures was the actual authority on those cultures. In an even later configuration, this is the figure that would come to be called an Orientalist. A respectable name until Edward Said came along and analyzed this more sinister meanings. <clears throat> but in spite of Said, 
Several contemporary accounts continue to see something genuine and humane underlying the necessary cynicism of weak cosmopolitanism. That is to say, the trader, they see something, they still see something which is humane and genuine in that weak cosmopolitanism as opposed to, say, the cosmopolitanism of the ethnologists of the 19th century or the race scientists of the 19th century. And these positions that want to insist on the humane in that ideal cosmopolitanism, they celebrate, I'm quoting William Dalrymple here, who's himself one of those figures. He celebrates men who are able to encounter those unlike themselves with enthusiasm and curiosity. This is what he sees as important. William Dalrymple, if you're not familiar with that name, he's a great friend of Turkey and he's written these great books, big, big fat books about the history of India, mostly. <clears throat> so for somebody like him and his work, it's, he both laments the passing of such humane contacts, the possibility of this kind of knowing about other cultures and also affirms the continuation in the modern world, that he's still writing books about that time and also with that, from that position. Furthermore, another famous historian, Bernard Smith, um, who writes mostly about the Pacific and the European presence in the Pacific and its general um, disruption, I suppose, he argues that this form of cosmopolitanism does not decenter the imperial subject, that is to say the imperializing subject, who sees, and I'm quoting Smith here, in every horizon of difference, new perspectives of its centrality, that is to say of the imperializing self's centrality. Difference does not decenter how the, this imperial gazer looks on because it doesn't actually change what he or she feels, it simply puts it in a different context. The normative, as it were, remains the normative, which is the self. So, so long as the source of the cosmopolitan inquiry is Europe, this is why, what I meant when I said it depends where you're standing when you ask this question, so long as the source of the cosmopolitan inquiry is Europe and the West, then the discourse remains stable. It really remains about the other rather than Europe. So that's one way of answering the question, what is cosmopolitanism? There is another way. This other way is not as forgiving in the same way as the first reply about curiosity and prefers to construct the cosmopolitan as a contestant that is to say that the second cosmopolitan, right? Not the first one. Prefers to construct this cosmopolitan as a contestant to the epistemologies that accompanied the expansion of Europe. Because it sees these epistemologies as uh, marginalizing and discrediting others in its privileging of the imperial self. Many of these accounts and I'll just mention a few names, so we have a you know, point of reference, as it were, without being able to go into them in great detail. So like people like Du Bois, uh, Franz Fanon, indeed Edward Said, Paul Gilroy, and others. These uh, theories, these commentators prefer a line of descent from the anti-colonial movement to uh, a worldly vision of human justice. So this is the, a different line towards the cosmopolitan, understanding uh, through the, the, um, the anti-colonial movement, which argued, of course, primarily that uh, the colonized people are, need their full rights as, uh, as subjects of their societies and so on. They need their full rights, full human uh, rights, etc. So 
from, uh, the, is from the anti-colonial movement, there is this line of descent to a vision of human justice. So this, to these committees, it seems a preferred way of thinking about difference and thinking about the world. This form of cosmopolitanism will have purged itself from racial thinking on the one hand, which the first one doesn't, because as we saw, the imperial self is secure and steady and undisturbed by the difference that it encounters. So it will have purged itself from racial thinking on the one hand, from the end also, on the other hand, from the smothering and uh, appropriating, sorry, from continuing, sorry, from the smothering and appropriating discourse of the colonial epistemology I referred to earlier, but it will also equally have liberated itself from the wounded discourse of colonial victimization. So any of you who are familiar with the work of particularly of Franz Fanon will know how firm he is about uh, both resisting uh, the, um, well, smothering would be a good word, I think, to return to, the smothering epistemology of uh, European colonialism, but he's also very, very, very uh, reluctant to embrace the, the, uh, the victimized discourse in particular, because that's what he had a particular experience of, of the negritude movement. But I think in general, the idea of uh, embracing the wounds of, of, uh, of colonialism as a way forward, he wants all that behind, and he wants to think about forward and human justice. In other words, having arrived at this other reading of what cosmopolitan means, what it means is that we, we do not have to regard literature in particular, but perhaps a worldview, but literature in particular as a global or a universal statement or account that speaks for the whole world as well, which is the assumption of the first cosmopolitanism, that we can start from a place of an, the enlightenment, and from this we can ask questions and broaden our knowledge of the world while we stay at home. It's instructive in addition to this, in addition to uh, assuming that cosmopolitan is not located in one place from which we are secure and can look on the world from there. It's instructive to think about where does the reader or the critic or the other participant, not the, if you're thinking about literature in particular, not the central part, the actor, which it might be the writer, uh, where they also stand, how they read. Just as a small example is to, uh, to, to think back to how the, the writings of, say, African <coughs> or Indian or Caribbean writers in English, for example, how they were received and who considered themselves the, the right um, critics and commentators for it. And if we think back a few years, things have changed, of course, but if you think back a few years, there was a considerable argument about who knew how to do this because of this notion of the universal. This, so the idea of universal kind of takes us back to, um, to that first way of, um, of thinking about what knowledge or indeed what uh, cosmopolitan means. I prefer to think that there are many cosmopolitanisms. If you were, say, like me, growing up in Zanzibar, uh, the Indian Ocean world, by which I mean the literal Indian Ocean, the coastline, as it were, uh, had more meaning uh, and uh, was much easier to understand than other ideas that were, one was having to take in because of going to school and this sort of thing. 
And these would have been uh, stories that were passed on. These would have been songs. These would have been, of course, the religion that most of us were sharing. Most of the people of the coastline of the Indian Ocean are Muslims. Um, that people went back and forth, they knew each other, etc. So I'm not making a, I'm not arguing for a kind of an Indian Ocean exceptionalism of, some, of one kind or another. I'm trying to say that there is a self-sustaining um, culture or web of cultures that is familiar and recognizable. People would say when I was growing up, to go back to Bombay, when he was Bombay. Um, and somebody would say, my uncle has just come back from I don't know, from Basra or something like that. And these were not alarming or sort of like exotic things. These were people came and went. This was part of the world. I imagine that if you were living in another web, if we think about it, in that way of, shall we say, South Asia or Southeast Asia, there would be another network which would also be self-sustaining in this way and would form its own world and would continue despite Coca-Cola, or, or those other things that we think of as globalization. Equally, you could go into you know, Kazakhstan and you might find another network. You might go into Ecuador and you would find other networks in this way. So I prefer to think that uh, all of these networks are forms of what cosmopolitan means. There is, after all, in addition to all this, there are certain things we can't do without and do have um, you know, uh, experts who, who are located in different places. You can't fly a plane, for example, with uh, knowing stories. You have to do other things to be able to, to both make a plane fly and also to know how to do it. Um, so there are forms of knowledge, although of course people who do this are not all from that place, like many of you as scientists know. Um, and if you're not a scientist even, you'll probably know that the makers of planes and rockets and guns and bombs in these big cities in the West or in the Soviet Union are not always from those places. Great minds travel from all over the world to go and build these things for them. So cosmopolitan then becomes something much more gentle almost, something we can all say we participate in. We don't need to be Orientalists. We don't need to speak uh, a dead language of some kind to be able to say, you know, we know about, you know, arcane things that nobody knows about. What we know about is knowledge. What we know about is as important as some other thing uh, written by somebody who has poured over archives and discovered a phrase or two that has previously not been known by other people. So then, when it comes to literature in particular, it seems to me that the local is truly the significant knowledge. And to, to try and aspire uh, from the beginning, as it were, to some idea of something called universal or something called globalized or something like that, is to miss the point, because the point the point about uh, knowledge and about knowing is to know specifically about what is close, about what people do and how people live, rather than uh, noble ideas and highfalutin rhetoric and that sort of thing. And I think this is what uh, I want to celebrate about the idea of post-colonial which is not something I'm gonna risk my life on, but just to celebrate uh, for the moment. Because what it does allow is that it allows us to see things, it forces us to see things in their local sense. If you're going to read a, uh, a text by, if I return for a moment to my Fijian writer, you have to know something about Fiji. You have to go and teach yourself about Fiji. You have to read something about Fiji. You can't just say, I'm a literary scholar, and this does not meet some you know, broad idea of what a, a powerful or good text should be. But you have to know something about where it's coming from. So that necessity for specificity 
somebody's annoyed because I'm missing out on this lecture here. <laughs> you have to know about the specificity of what that writing is coming from in order to be able to make that assessment, that judgment. You can't otherwise shut up and go and read your own books. But if you are going to read something that is coming from somewhere else, then you have to have a sense of the locality as it were, and the sense of its history and the sense of its meaning. So that, to me, is the significance of the local. I think it's time to have a pause there and see what questions there are amongst the team. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks so much, uh, Prof. Uh, Gunnar, for that uh, fascinating talk about uh, literature, the local, uh, perhaps the global, and the cosmopolitan as well. You say the local is truly the significant knowledge, and I think um, much of our questions speak to that uh, issue. Right, our panel is now on stage and we will ask a few questions to Professor Guna and if we have time, we will have one or two questions from the floor. Okay, we'll begin with uh, Professor Shanaid and then we'll go to uh, Dr. Uhuru Palafala. Yes. So the first question is, is for this audience that is diverse, um, with scholars from different disciplines across the university, scholars for whom writing is central to their enterprise, would you please explain to us what writing means to you? And in light of yesterday's talk about rereading, would you also comment on the act of rewriting? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what the rewriting question is about. <laughs> uh, do you mean revising? Uh, okay. So the first question was about uh, what does writing mean to me? Uh, well, it's when you start something, doing something like that, I wouldn't be able to answer this question if you asked me at the beginning of what I was starting to do, which is writing. Because uh, for me, it was written by a, a kind of anxiety, uh, a, a need to, to reflect on certain issues that were important at the time, which were quite simply uh, being a stranger in the UK and being a stranger means both you're in a strange place but also means that you're connected to the place that's familiar to you. So both these issues were things uh, that I had to learn to I had to reflect on to try and understand. So it was driven in that way by that. So I wasn't at that point thinking what is the point of doing this? I just thought this seems something important to do. It's necessary to do. Um, I didn't even think that I was writing for anybody in particular. But uh, as this goes on, and because writers are also readers, and you read about other people's experiences, and you read about how other people are doing other things, and you read, of course, for pleasure as well, and uh, to admire uh, how things are done, then your ambition grows. It's the only thing. I think I want to write better than this. I think I want to do better than this. Um, and the combination of all of these things, first the feeling that there is something that needs to be said that I need to think about and to write it down. Not because it's important to you, particularly, or to any reader or anything like that, but it's important to me to, to understand what, what this means. But at the same time, as you continue doing it, as time passes and you continue doing it, it's quite laborious 
doing these things. You can't write it in two weeks or something like that. It's, it takes time. Then you want to make it as beautiful as you can as well. You want to make it work better and so on. Um, and it's like an athlete, you see, once you start training, and you start doing time, you say, yeah, I can run faster than this, I can do this, and then you're hooked. And then you just keep doing it. And then things begin to go to, somebody reads it and so on, and then that is also another phase in the writing process, that is to say, you are now definitely writing for you, uh, as well as for me. So there are different stages, I think. Um, and um, it takes a long time. I don't know how many writers or even secret writers there are here. Um, but it takes a long time from actually starting to do it to the thing actually seeing um, the light of day, as it were. It takes a long time to even to be able to say, I'm a writer, because um, writers have books, and if you don't have them, if you haven't published something, then you're still not a writer. And even if you publish something, um, it means somebody likes it. It doesn't mean everybody likes it. And so again, it takes time, it takes time. So rewriting is just a necessary part, to answer the second part of your question, it's just a necessary part of the process. You write, you write again, you write, you write again, and so on. There's nothing, that is the really the sweaty part the writing again, but you know, it's, it's the essential part of it. Thanks, Prof. In, in part, you answered the, the second question, which was, um, when you began writing, before you had a large body of work, did you have a, a message or a question that you consciously wished to engage? And, the reason for asking this question is because during our future professor program sessions, we've been encouraged to think about the one simple question that our body of work is, is, uh, is about, is trying to engage. And I, and I wonder if, um, uh, if, if you, having, having reached the stage that you are now as a Nobel laureate, did you start with a question or a message in mind? I, I started to write, as I said, for you know, those reasons of having to find myself as a stranger there in the UK. And sometime during this stage, I was also uh, studying literature. And at, the very, at a very early stage, I knew that um, what I wanted, the ambition that I had, which, of course, we don't always, are not always lucky enough to realize our ambitions, but the ambition that I had was that I wanted to, to be an academic and to be a writer. I wanted to do both these things. I wanted to be an academic because I loved um, what I was doing as a literature student. I loved literature, I loved reading and talking about these texts. And in particular, because at that time I was uh, reading quite a lot of African writing, as well as other writers, but I was reading quite a lot of African writing. And it was during that period that I first came across this argument that I referred to about uh, who has the right to speak, etc. This was the argument that was raging in those early, sorry, in those late 70s, when I was completing my undergraduate degree. So I thought at that point, what I want to do is I want to write my PhD on this issue, this very issue of uh, criticism and who is the critic, who has the authority to speak about, um, about these matters, about these texts. So that was important, that idea of challenging, I suppose, um, a certain authoritarian way of thinking about knowledge or thinking about uh, dissemination of knowledge. I think I was, what I wanted to do with the fiction was more complex, more complicated. <clears throat> and it's not easy to bring it down, so I think it's in, schol in scholarship it is easier to bring it down to the kind of what's the main idea, what's the central idea that you're after, what's your project, 
Um, I think in scholarship it is perhaps easier to do that uh, than in, in writing fiction, or at least the kind of fiction I am interested in writing, which is always complicated because, well, that's the whole point of saying, you know, actually you can't know things fully. You can only know things in fragments in this way. You can't really write, you can, I suppose, Derrida does, but you, you, you can't really write scholarship that says, I'm not sure. You know, mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to force yourself into a position of speaking with authority, in a way, uh, about whatever it is that you're researching, whatever it is that you know about. So I think it is possible to aspire to, so maybe if you're, if you're an intelligent scholar, you keep the aspiration to something manageable. Uh, but you know the, the wonderful thing about fiction, of course, is that you don't have to set any limits. And you can explore ideas and leave them trailing all over the place um, for people to work out, because they too have their own fragments of ideas that can't quite spin down fully. Um, so I can answer the question to a certain extent with um, my academic work, but I think with fiction it would be to say, well, there was this and there was that and there was this and there was that and there was the other. But well, one, certainly one important thing, as I said, is try to work things out for myself in the first instance, trying to understand what it means, say, to become a refugee, for example or what it, what it means to have a horrible <coughs> secret circulating in the family, um, or in particular, how to try and tell the story of the colonial encounter so that it's not uh, full of um, simplifications and stereotypes and on both sides. But, so all of those would be the ideas that were behind it. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you, Prof. Um, I too want to thank you for taking us right into the heart of um, debates on um, locality, the universal, and the cosmopolitan. But before I move on to my own question, I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to ask any questions that might arise. Okay, I see there's already one there. Two, okay, let me take two, and then I will move on to my own question. So please go ahead. Easy. Uh, okay. okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's a microphone. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. I'm Mario Schroeder from the University of I, I am a political scientist, so I'm, I'm going to, to bring it back to the issue of authority um, with regards to it. And, and the reason why I'm going back to that is because, you see, there are in and out group identities. And <clears throat> so I've, I've lived here for a couple of years, close to 20 years, but if I'm to, I'm from Cameroon, by the way. So if I'm to, if I'm to call in a radio station, and comment on what's about the politics. Someone would say, where is this one coming from? Um, do you have the right to speak about what is happening here? And, and, and added to that, the, there, are certain, there might be certain lived experiences which, by virtue of the politics of indigenization, locals would believe that they stand a better chance of understanding those nuances which outsiders might not, might not understand. So, do you think, I know you mentioned that it doesn't matter, but do you think that um, certain people might have the authority, maybe, maybe putting the politics aside, might have the authority to, to speak about certain, or write about certain things? And, and I remember things like uh, Chino Achebe who once said that um, if, if, if lions don't have their own story, the skills of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So the simple question is, do you think that certain locals would stand or have more authority to write about certain things than outsiders, given the fact that outsiders might also have certain de uh, degrees of bias when they are commenting on certain issues? Thank you very much. Yes, sure. Thank you for that. Um, 
Of course, local um, authorities, if we put that in inverted commas as well, can some, sometimes be quite weird as well in their own misunderstanding. Yes. Uh, and can be quite firm in what they think they have authority over. So I'm not saying just simply that the local voice is always um, the most correct voice. What I'm saying is that you, if you wish to uh, speak about any historical, or I mean any, any locality or any, any environment or any phenomenon in this way, you have to understand it from the point of view of those who are in it. Um, uh, it's quite possible, you're right, it's quite possible that uh, the most knowledgeable person about uh, a stretch of uh, coastline archaeologically might very well be somebody who operates from Leiden University or something like that uh, and the uh, piece of coast is in Zanzibar. It's quite possible. That doesn't mean that this person does not have the authority to speak about that. This person does not go out of that knowledge of the authority to speak, let's say, about um, child marriage in Zanzibar or other issues to do with Zanzibar. The authority relates to whatever it is that the person knows or can know or can teach because sometimes, sometimes when you live as you are locally, you don't see what's in front of you and it needs somebody else to come along and say, look at this beautiful, and you think, what, what, what beautiful? What's, what's so beautiful about that? Uh, so sometimes it does need another perspective, another point of view in this way. So I'm not giving authority to, to the native voice, as it were, as the only voice that can speak. But I am saying that you can't just go ignoring the native voice um, and that it's better to pay attention to it and say, I think that sounds mad, so I'm going to disregard that. Or that makes sense. Or let, let me check with somebody else. You know, a certain kind of humility about how you approach yes. uh, questions of other places. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and in many ways, you are giving us insight into uh, current debates around identity politics and appropriation. Who can talk about what, who can wear what, um, who's allowed to speak to what. And I like that you use the word author authoritarianism because it does really um, squander debate. It stops a conversation before it can even develop into something fruitful. So thank you for that. Um, there was another question there at the back. Um, 
in the way it's formulated, I don't think, because that's just inviting me to talk about colonialism in the whole world or something like that. I, I don't know if that's so. There are many different things in that, in, in that question and the source of your question, I understand that. Um, I want to be optimistic about um, saying, yes, there is progress. Clearly there is progress. Uh, if we're talking about particular countries, you'd have to go to particular countries. I don't mean physically go, but look at what's going on in particular countries and see what that means, what progress there is, um, and what indeed is still to be done. Um, it's possibly always a good thing to be dissatisfied with what is being done. Unfortunately, in many places, certainly in my country, it's not very hard to be dissatisfied <laughs> with a great deal. Uh, that is going on. Um, and, you know, I don't want to generalize by characterizing and saying it's because of this or it's because of that or it's because of whatever. There are many reasons why colonialism and its consequences have not gone away. Um, part of that reason is because the stranglehold of both economic as well as in other ways in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, take the example of COVID and the, uh, um, the production of the vaccine, for example. And you see immediately the great power of, uh, of, of certain nations of certain parts of the world and the great powerlessness of others and their dependency. Uh, so there is that. There is the economic dependency. That there are all sorts of reasons why it's been impossible to shake off as it were colonialism and say, yep, we're not, and we also have ourselves to blame for uh, our own stupidities and our own authoritarian tendencies and our own greedy bastards who um, do what they have to do. So it's difficult to answer that question in a, without saying, I am optimistic, and there are progresses of various kinds, but there's still a lot to do. questions. Uh, we'll open uh, to the audience in the next round. Uh, Prof, there are a number of African writers who um, either achieved some successes in the West uh, and, and who went to write from the West after those successes. I'm thinking about Chinua Achebe, Ngubiwa Tiongo, Zizunda, Ben Okri, Chimamanda, Ngozi Adichie, Wale Shewinga, and, and yourself. And um, Talia Silasi talks about them as Africans of the world. And she coins this term Afropolitanism, um, I suppose, to speak to cosmopolitanism. What do you think about this concept of Afropolitanism? Um, as a concept to identify and mark this um, sense of Africanness, writing and location. Fine, good. <laughs> <laughs> as I said earlier, I think I think of uh, terms of description like this as as provisional. Uh, if it works for now, fine. It's all right. Um, <coughs> I've heard this term used, and sometimes I'm a little bit nervous of its association with Afrocentrism. Um, and I'm not really familiar enough with it to say that it is indeed associated with Afrocentrism. I have heard it and thought, uh, do we need it? Do we need a term like this? Um, how does it help? But if some people find it helpful, that's okay with me. I don't. Um, the reason I'm nervous of, of Afrocentrism is I suspect there is a, a race dimension in it which seeks to exclude rather than to include. And I think that's what bothers me. So if Afropolitan is also, is also something with, with stuff like that lurking around the edges, then I'll be nervous of that as well. To give you an example, <coughs> which is to do with this blessed wonderful Nobel business, which is to say, uh, Abdul Razak Gurna is the fourth African, no, the sixth African, no, the seventh African. 
to have been awarded this. And behind that is an assumption that seeks to, for example, exclude uh, uh, Nadine Kotima and Jane Kutzea, for example, mm -hmm. or to exclude Nagima Mahfouz. Um, and I just don't think this is helpful. I think this is to bring race into something that's nothing to do with it. Um, and to, to, in fact, go for a kind of simplified version or simplified understanding of what even that Afro or Africa or African means. Mm. But it, maybe that's not what Afropolitan means. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just made nervous a little bit. Yes, in many ways you're, you're thinking or speaking to the term of African as um, conceptualized from the colonial center in that first cosmopolitanism you are talking about. Um, my next question has to do with your own local and your own localities. Would you say your new local is inspiring different stories from you? Do you feel like your imagination is being um, set or reset by new environments? And can we expect a, a shift in your themes, in your settings, symbolisms, and the social issues that you deal with? On, on that last, you mean as a result of uh, anything in particular? <laughs> no, you are, I don't know that you can expect many uh, different anything from... As I see it often, <coughs> writers, uh, speaking for myself, and I think one or two others, but certainly for myself, uh, have only a limited number of issues that they engage with. And I don't think this is just simply a matter of choice. Um, if you think of the way that uh, the, the subject that a lifetime's work is well, of a writer, uh, of a certain kind anyway, I think they come back to the, to the same issues as if circling them. And I have this image, which I think I use actually in somewhere by the sea, uh, of some, something like um, a fowl, uh, a hen, or cockerel or something like that, uh, with a piece of string tied to its leg and stick fixed to the ground. And this is, this is the area that you're scratching away at all the time. So I see it like that. So there's really no escape. I mean, when, when, I, when I'm, I have an idea that I want to write about, um, Um, let's say, for example, like in The Last Gift, where I wanted to write about uh, uh, a family secret, some, some, uh, something that the, one of the parents has not spoken about to, uh, to his wife or to his children and so on. And that's the idea that I was interested in writing about. But I find sooner or later I'm, I'm setting all of this in, in Zanzibar or somewhere like Zanzibar. And so even think, yeah, next book I'm not going to write about Zanzibar. I'm going to write about something else. But sooner or later, I find my mind is going back there, and I'm writing about that. So I suspect this, there isn't really as much choice yeah. uh, as w one imagines, um, that it, you can, can invent something. I don't make things up. I don't write fiction, but I don't make it up. It, it comes because this is what I know. Uh, and therefore, it's very difficult to say, to escape that and to, to go somewhere else. Um, of course, there's a possibility of doing research in a different area, different period, this kind of thing. But the things that I find, the things I know about always come back and need to be re-examined in the light of this, whatever it is that I'm uh, thinking about and talking about. So no, I'm afraid there's not going to be any new directions. <laughs> I guess it speaks to what you said in an interview about um, new local perhaps offering more complexity on the same kind of issues that you've been thinking about. Sure, sure. Yeah. I will now hand over to uh, Professor Nami for his set of questions. Thank you for your answers. Yes, thanks. Um, I, I'm interested in uh, what you do with the differences, or perhaps what you have done with differences. Uh, differences in 
notions of stories, differences in notions of storytelling uh, between uh, Zanzibar and uh, the place where you live now. What do you do with uh, these differences? Well, I didn't consciously think about this um, idea um, until, I suppose, until I, I came to writing Paradise, because because it was um, it was all going to be happening in um, in that part of uh, of Africa where I grew up, along the coast and the interior. <coughs> And then I began to think about um, how the language would have changed, the language of that time to the language of now, and how to represent that in English. So what kind of English to use. Um, and I've, yeah, then I became much more aware. I think I was aware before, but not quite as much, not quite as concerned. Um, but I think then I became much more aware about how to deliver this uh, account of a, this narrative of a different time um, without making it without making it seem archaic, if you see what I mean, without making it seem like a, a lost language or something like that. But it was very interesting. It, 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 I, I feel that it gives me. Um, something more. It doesn't take anything away. It gives me something more in that I have uh, two imaginaries, as it were. Um, both the Swahili and the knowledge of Swahili, and a life growing up there, and living in England and writing in English, and a reader of English. And so I think this actually provides quite a dynamic and interesting complexity. In, in the way in which then I'm, I'm constructing or making a, uh, the language work for me. So I, th I think of it as just simply a, a benefit, not a problem. Yes, interesting. And there's uh, a follow-up to that. Um, what would you say draws people to your work? Um, can you trace that to the kinds of uh, things that are part of your imagination um, uh, as you have shifted from uh, Zanzibar to, to England? I wish I knew, because I do it every time. Uh, no, no, of course I, I do know because people speak to me and talk to me and tell me what, what they think. I think for me, it's been the most, uh, most uh, amazing and just very unbelievably wonderful to discover um, how people uh, from so many different parts of the world were reading uh, what I was writing. And this is not just because of uh, not just because it's not a small thing, of course, but it isn't because of the Nobel Award. Uh, but rather, one of the discoveries, well, email, of course, people send you emails and from all over the place, all over the world. But also, as I've been going around, traveling to different places since that award, uh, people come with old copies and say, I've been reading your books for the last 15 years and all this kind of thing. Um, so I don't know. I I like to think that because I'm mostly just writing about this little dots off the edge of uh, Africa down there on six degrees south um, or up there rather on six degrees south. Um, it wasn't. It did not occur to me that um, because I'm so interested in the local. It didn't occur to me that this would have the same kind of meaning, if you like, to somebody in Argentina reading this. So, but it seems to. So I don't know. I don't know why, what it does, but I, I like to think that maybe because it's, it's um, 
is what literature does to all of us, to, to me. I know that uh, I read um, for complicated reasons. I don't just read because I want to forget or I want to pass time or whatever. I read because it brings me pleasure. I read because I've, I get news from other places. Um, I see how things are done. I'm, I see myself. Think, ah, yes, I know, that's how I feel. Or sometimes I, it forces me to rethink about what I think of myself. So maybe these processes, uh, these <coughs> reading processes, are not really about uh, where it comes from. Perhaps these processes are what leads us to say, but I don't know anything about what this place is like now. I found out something, I'll Google this and find out a bit more, or whatever. So there's that other part of it as a way of expanding what we know and expanding our understanding of, of other things and other places, and of course ourselves as well at the same time. Yes, we are pretty much done with our prepared questions, but I feel as Poshia does that uh, there are a few burning questions we can take to. Good morning. Uh, well, thank you very much for your lecture yesterday and uh, today. This is a very personal question. Uh, you talked about the content and all the very intricate things you write about. Many of uh, the future professors here, like many of us, every time we meet them, say, would I ever reach that university? Would I get to the full professorship? What does the Nobel Prize mean to you? I know partially you answered when you started writing, I think that you planned it. But what have you done in the years that you get to hear? How did you feel that morning when that phone call came to you? You reached your, you know, what? Well, I thought this can't be true. <laughs> was the first thought. Um, but then, of course, I was, it was a great surprise. It was a complete, complete surprise. Um, as you know, when, um, as, as the, uh, the, the date of the um, announcement approaches, then various uh, newspapers come up with their short lists. And it's going to be this one this year, or one of these, one of these. Nobody ever mentioned me, as far as I'm aware. Um, so it, it never occurred to me that, yes, I'm in the running. I was kind of quite innocently going about my business. But of course it's a great thing, because it's, it's, it's something everybody, even people who are not readers, I mean, you know, I mean serious readers, I mean people who are just casual readers, know what it means. Even people who don't read know what it means. Uh, and so that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that it's a, it's a, a recognition of your work from people who, who have been doing this for a good 120 years, and in that list, I included many people, many eminent writers whose, whose work I admire. So they can't be all wrong uh, in the choices that they make. And so there is that too, the, the idea of your work being recognized in this way. Uh, and then finally, and it's still also very, well, it's not finally, but anyway, very importantly, it means people want to read the work of this uh, person. Um, and so uh, all the books that were out of print come back into print, new editions coming out everywhere, translations everywhere, and all this kind of thing. And for a writer, of course, nothing can be more wonderful than that. So I don't know, if, for me, it was not something that was part of my work plan. As well. I wasn't saying to myself, right, uh, when I get to 45, I'll be a professor, when I get to 55, I'll be um, this, and when I get to 72, <laughs> I'll win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> no, it wasn't a plan, it's just how... I think the only thing I can say to, to, to you, particularly you who are still in the throes of your moving into the career, as it were, is that that's all it is, it's just work. You just get on with your work. Take it seriously, get on with your work. And what comes will come. Uh, thank you so much.
much. I really enjoyed this um, from a biological sciences background. This was absolutely amazing to really enjoy humanities. Uh, I've got one question. <laughs> absolutely amazing and I open it. I've got one question for you, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Personal. Uh, you know, you've got really quite an amazing body of work. And if you were to reflect and say which one of those, you know, are more like I'm, I'm tempted to say pick one, you know, if you were to look at it and think about it, would you say the most profound for you and why? Yeah, I did have this conversation with uh, somebody yesterday. And I tried to uh, evade it, which I'm going to try and do again. <laughs> By quoting the example of uh, Dickens, Charles Dickens, who when he, whenever he was asked this question, he would, he would say, they're all my children. <laughs> so I think I'm going to pass on that one. Professor Gurna, okay. in South Africa we have had tremendous debate um, we have had tremendous debate uh, some quite uh, in your face debates about what is in a curriculum what is excluded what is included uh, what is valued what is devalued uh, whether we are doing any justice uh, to our writers, to our artists. Uh, so of course it comes in waves, as things do, and uh, it's either in fashion or out of fashion, but even the transformation debates uh, in South Africa run in cycles. So we've just had a resurgence in 2015, 2016, where there were deep conversations about our curriculum at universities. I would just be interested, given your talk yesterday, about Peter Abrahams and uh, how he has faded from the visible memory and has receded, and uh, how do we take this forward? Because there is a kind of social justice imperative even in the curriculum that we teach. Just your views, thank you. Well, I think it's a, quite appropriate to have these conversations, heated or not, uh, about what should be in the curriculum, um, rather than for it to be um, sort of set and um, inflexible or whatever. Um, so, in the first place, I think it's, it's, it's not a bad thing, necessarily. It might be disruptive to some extent, particularly if you're running a program, uh, and especially if the biggest noise is being, is being made with, uh, with an authoritarian voice, if, if the result is actually to stifle um, inquiry and exploration. So, but unfortunately, that is also part of the process of putting things right, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. Some years ago, there was uh, a, a similar kind of uh, discomfort with uh, the school curriculum in Kenya, <coughs> secondary school curriculum leading up to university. Um, and a commission was set up to, to see, to, you know, to kind of re-examine and to think, come up with new ideas about both the uh, the structure as well as the content of what should be in the curriculum. Freehand, they took several years and they came back with a wonderful, um, you know, explorative sort of uh, thing that opens things up for students and so on. The, uh, the boss then was uh, President Moy uh, and he looked at this thing and he said, where's Shakespeare? <laughs> How can you? how can you deprive these uh, school kids of Shakespeare? And he threw the whole thing out because there was no Shakespeare there. So when you get that kind of thing, then nothing's happening. But, but if the conversation is one that is developing, then it seems to me this is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, 
Also, I'm not so sure about national curriculum. I mean, yeah. I know all sorts of uh, countries, including uh, the UK at the moment, which is a highly advanced system, which is, has lots of uh, libertarian room, as it were, for them. But nonetheless, they're kind of constantly returning to this idea of a national curriculum, which fortunately doesn't work because of different examining boards. So that actually allows different examining boards to set different standards and so on. I don't think it's going to end. I think this is, this is the nature of, of this uh, process of these institutions. And I think possibly it's better that there is conversation than if that there isn't. But you may not think so. If they're disruptive, I don't know. I don't know enough about the actual conversations you're having here. I would imagine if the conversations are leading towards restriction or leading towards silencing, like not using certain words or not addressing certain subjects or whatever, which I would have thought was also part of the, of the problem everywhere, then that is that is the wrong direction. But if the direction is towards opening issues up and talking about them, then I think that's fine. Right. Unfortunately, we have run out of time to take uh, more questions. And that leads me to thank our guest speaker today, um, Professor Guna. Thanks very much for coming through coming through for Noni Jawab as well. Um, I, I believe our fellows uh, have something, actually a lot to take away from uh, this uh, event today. Uh, we have uh, a token of appreciation from uh, the organizers. Uh, that's something that I should present to you now. Uh, yes. <laughs> Not too big. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, it's big. <laughs> it feels like it might be something one can consume. <laughs> no, it's books. <laughs> Memory of Departure, published in 1987, is about a failed uprising. His most recent afterlife in 2020 set, is set at the beginning of the century and it tracks protagonists' history down through generations. Paradise, published in 1994, was shortlisted for both the Booker and the Whitbread Prize. By the Sea in 2001, was longlisted for the Booker and shortlisted for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. In all of his work, Professor Gurner strives to avoid nostalgia for a romantically pristine pre-colonial Africa. Indeed, his own background was on an Indian Ocean island that was a highly cosmopolitan place. His writing is from exile, but pertains to his relationship with the place he left, so memory 
is vital to his work. And one reviewer points to the vivid complexity of his work, highlighting his dedication to truth and aversion to simplification. Given the parallels in their personal historical trajectories, given the richness of their prose and the pithiness of their insights, how I wish I could have been witness to a conversation between Nonny and Professor Gurner. But I'm sure that our conversation today will be equally engaging. Over to you, Professor Gurner. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the split site session of the Noni Jabavu Lecture, an event that is normally hosted by the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Fort Hare. Today's Noni Jabavu Lecture is a little different. It's hosted by the Future Professors Program and ASAF in collaboration with the University of Fort Hare. And we have an illustrious guest. Um, today's lecture is presented by 2021 Nobel Laureate in Literature, Professor Abdul Razak Gurner. I'm Neil Roos, I'm a Professor of History, and I'm Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Fort Hare. And I will be chairing the session from the University of Fort Hare in Alice. Professor Gurner and others on the panel, Professor Oliver Nyambi, Professor Shanade Barnabas, Dr. Uhuru Palafala, Dr. Valerie Farim are in Stellenbosch. Some of the audience are in Stellenbosch and some are in Alice. Some are further afield in places like Mtata. And these arrangements to me seem like a metaphor for the dystopias as well as the expansions and contractions of distance that characterize the COVID epoch and which mark post-colonial life including histories of migration, of displacement, and the development of continental diasporas. Today's lecture also foregrounds signs of collaboration, of solidarity, of connections between institutions and individuals across the country, the continent, the African diaspora. And of course, the most notable of these connections is Professor Gurner agreeing to speak with us today. After me briefly explaining what the Noni Jabavu lectures do, Professor Gurner will speak. Thereafter, our panel will pose a number of questions, and there may be time for one or two follow-up questions, although Professor Nyambi will figure out if there is indeed enough time left over for this. Some background about the University of Fort Hare and the Noni Jabavu lectures. After a difficult period when parts of this historic university were placed under administration, the universities entered what it describes as a decade of renewal. As far as I understand it, the faculty's role in this decade of renewal is to reconsider and refresh and renew the disciplines in the social sciences and humanities. And to this end, me, along with conveners, Tando Nomkoya and Valerie Farim decided to host a quarterly seminar, each with an invited speaker. Normally we have two respondents, one commenting on what the presentation indicates about teaching and one on what it does for research. But this format isn't cast in stone. What is germane is that the lecture ought to make us think about teaching and research at a particular time in a particular geography, in a context shaped by a particular history. And to signal the significance of these seminars and to elevate their profile, we chose to designate them to be a named series. And in this regard, we named them for Nontando Noni Chibavu. And today, we could not hope for a more illustrious and insightful speaker whom we are privileged to co-host with our partners, Professor Gurner. Noni Jabavu lived between 1919 and 2008, and she was a South African writer and a journalist. 
Her major works were memoirs, The People in 1962 and Drawn in Color in 1963. And in 1961, she was appointed editor of the New Strand, which was a major British literary magazine. Jabavu was born in the Eastern Cape to a family of prominent intellectuals. In fact, her father, DDT Jabavu, was a founding member of the academic staff at the University of Fort Hare. And she was educated in England, but made regular trips back to South Africa. And in her work, Drawn in Color, as well as her essays, she returns to the question of what it meant to be an African, yet driven by circumstances to live outside of her country. In many sense, a history which parallels that of Professor Gurner. A few words now about our guest, Professor Abdul Razak Gurner, whose life bears, as I say, some interesting parallels to Noni's. Professor Gurner was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for, I quote, his uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism and the fate of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. Professor Gurner was born in Zanzibar in 1948, and he emigrated to England in 1968 with a view to pursuing a university education. And he was driven to flee Zanzibar, which was part of the newly formed Republic of Tanzania, by civil unrest, where violence against the Arab population made it a very inhospitable place. He was not able to return to Zanzibar until 1984, in time to see his father, shortly before his father passed on. Professor Gurner received his PhD from the University of Kent, where he would go on to be Professor of Postcolonial Literature. And he writes about the experience of migrants to Britain, the experience of individuals living in Zanzibar, and how individuals living in these two places find roots into their respective subjectivities. Professor Gurner is the author of 10 novels and numerous short stories. His first novel, Memory of Departure, published in 1987, is about a failed uprising. His most recent, Afterlife in 2020, set, is set at the beginning of the century, and it tracks protagonists' history down through generations. Paradise, published in 1994, was shortlisted for both the Booker and the Whitbread Prize. By the Sea in 2001, was longlisted for the Booker and shortlisted for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. In all of his work, Professor Gurner strives to avoid nostalgia for a romantically pristine pre-colonial Africa. Indeed, his own background was on an Indian Ocean island that was a highly cosmopolitan place. His writing is from exile, but pertains to his relationship with the place he left, so memory is vital to his work. And one